not particularly a threat, um, but, but close. Um, testing. Fantastic. Um, now, I'm going to show you a bunch of headlines. Um, Nigeria switches currency. I'm sure you saw it in one of your textbooks in maybe primary or secondary school. And it looks just like this. Um, here's another ed headline. Now, these two things happened in the same month. Uh, I'm not going to say the year yet, but let's say January. It happened in January. If um, 36 countries showed up in Lagos for the um, Afghan games. Interestingly, it's happening right now. Um, Go on was delivering a speech. And he said that he said something about like Nigeria being home for like black people everywhere. So it was an interesting time in Nigeria's history. We're positioning and we had a narrative where the force for black people everywhere. Now another interesting headline. Same month, January, um, the plane crash in Kano, 180 people were dead, were um, died almost instantly, mostly instantly. And at the time of this plane crash, it was the most, it was the worst air disaster in human history. <laughs> um, Ghanaians came to Lagos and decked us, 3-2, and, and we rioted. Um, patriotic, not good, but patriotic. Um, I mean, we know how the last Afghan went. Uh, now, 14, ki 14 killed by mobs in northern Nigeria. Um, you're not going to believe what they, what they were killed for. Um, surprise, surprise. Phoenixes. Um, 14 people that were killed were because there was a rumor that, oh, as usual, they started snatching penises. So they killed people across, like just killing people that they just suspected, as still happens. Now, the interesting thing is that all of these things happened in 1973. Um, second interesting fact is that I was not there. Um, but the only way I can access these things is by looking into archives. And the interesting problem is that all these headlines are from the New York Times. Um, I keep a New York Times subscription. Um, and the only reason I keep that, I mean, I have many reasons, but one of the major reasons I keep it is because when I need to understand history, when I need to reference material, I find myself always going to the New York Times. Um, and here's an interesting headline from the New York Times. Um, wife of jailed Nigerian opposition leader is slain. Right? Um, and now this is a Nigerian headline of the same story. How could he die? Um, and here's the interesting thing. The New York Times perspective is valid. It's extremely valid and important. Because it, it tells you what does the person in New York care about when they think about Nigeria. But there's also a perspective that is very, very important, which is what does a Nigerian in Nigeria or Nigerian anywhere think about when they think about an event? Now, not only did, when you look at this story, um, the big difference is like how could he die? Like Kudir Abiola in the 90s was such a huge galvanizing figure for Nigerians everywhere, and women especially. Um, but when you think of the New York Times as the most accessible way to access, the, like to view the world, it just robs it of all of context, all the context. In fact, in the particular story I just showed you from the headline I showed you from New York Times, her name pops up in the second paragraph, and, and she's referred to as just a businesswoman. She's a businesswoman, but she was also many things. Um, now, if I go looking for the Nigerian version. Of, of these stories, like the headlines I showed you from the New York Times, all of them exist, but they are here in archives and libraries everywhere. And I've, I even found this by accident. In 2019, I was traveling across, I, I scammed my employer, and so he, they, they, they allowed me to travel across West Africa on this trip called um, Jollof Road. So when I was re entering Nigeria through Niger, Sokoto, I found um, an archive and library, and, and I saw old newspapers. I said, oh, how, this is impressive. You guys have this here. And they're like, oh, yeah, like many libraries across Nigeria have archives like this, including the University of Ibadan. Shout out to Kennedy K. Um, he's the reason why all of this even exists, to be honest. Now, the problem with this context that I was, I'm going to the New York Times for, the problem with the Nigerian version of it is that 
it will take you roughly five hours to find something, right? You make a commitment to leave your house. You, if you live in a place like, say, Lagos, um, you go through the traffic, you get to the archives, you deal with, I don't know, maybe a, a, an, a librarian who woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Um, you search for hours. Hopefully, you find something. But the question that my friends and I like started to ask is that what if we could take those five hours and cut it down to five minutes? What if we could cut it to five seconds? What if we figured out how to make this accessible at the speed of search? Um, older people, because I'm Jay-Z, I'm young, um, <laughs> like to insist that younger people are lazy and everything, right? But what is actually happening, and what happens every generation is that the way we transmit information gets better and faster. And it is only a moral expectation, not a realistic one, to expect that people will stick to older methods um, for new ways to like access information. Now, back to the loss. Um, an interesting thing is happening here. It's, it's quite frankly a crossroads. The context of the past, there is missing out on all this context. And you might think, yeah, yeah, so what? Why does it matter? But in the context of the future, an interesting thing is happening. Um, for example, only 24% of all entries on Wikipedia in Nigeria are about women, right? When you hear about someone like um, Fula, um, Fumla Ransom quickly, the only time you encounter her in the Nigerian book is first man to drive a car. I mean, we now know better, right? Uh, but you start to ask yourself, who are all the other people who are like grossly underrepresented, whose voices do not appear simply because we haven't done the work of making it accessible? Um, on Wikipedia, that's the first logo left. I found an interesting entry, um, the Eva Valley incident. That's what it's called. But it was a massacre, in fact, by British officials where they killed um, dozens of um, mine workers in Inugu who were protesting. Now, that event has only four sentences on Wikipedia. But it was such a big and galvanizing force in the 50s that it was a big part of the pro independence movement. But such a significant aspect of how we even see ourselves was so grossly represented. Something I think about a lot is this. If a thing, when you think of any entity, whether it's a, an, an, an animal, whether it's a human being, whether it's a country, it's only as sentient as an awareness of itself. And awareness tends to be rooted in knowledge, and knowledge is rooted in context. And if, if we know so little about ourselves, the question just becomes like, what are we, right? Um, if you go to ChatGPT or even Google and try to ask a question about Nigeria, the random question I was asking someone earlier was, ask Google what happened on March 6, 1964, in Lagos or in Nigeria or in Ibadan, anywhere. You won't find anything because the places and the data sets that these things will pull from, they do not have African and Nigerian context in them. Um, think of the entire AI revolution as standing on four legs. There is infrastructure, that's the chips, right? NVIDIA and all of that. Um, there is compute, which is like, think of it as the large language models and just the algorithms that make it possible. Um, there is the talent who is doing all of this. But the last and interesting one is data. The reason why these tools that we enjoy, ChatGPT, everybody here uses ChatGPT, I imagine, do not have enough of us is because there is not enough of us that exists that is accessible to them. To put it, and this is not, I guess this is an interesting, let's say pun. Is it a pun if I say it's a pun? Um, but there's a reason why stuff like this, the newspapers they're looking at, are called dark data. And you literally shine the light on them by digitizing them. <laughs> um, and that's pretty much a question that myself and the, the, the bunch of my friends continue to ask, ask ourselves. Now, this is um, Boiga. You can't see his face, but he has great hair. Um, best hair on the team. Um, and this is like a very, very basic setup. But I'm going to use this picture to tell you about everything we've tried to do. Um, so what we found all this about, the first question we asked ourselves is, what does it look like if we actually take these papers and digitize them and make them accessible online? So the first thing we did was, oh, let's find the newspapers. We went looking for papers from 1960 to 2010, just as a focus period. 
we found 97% of papers from this period for at least one issue per day from this period. And next question became, oh, let's scan it, but you can't do that with a regular scanner, a large format scanner. Oh, let's raise money and then bought a scanner and it took forever to get here. Um, and now we are scanning. And here's the interesting thing. Um, think of everything here. Our job is fundamentally to take it here. Our job is for you to search for University of Ibadan and um, find articles about what it felt like when Achebe was, it, was like in this town with you guys. Uh, what it felt like when um, Wally was having his hot take from this town. Um, and what it felt like when, um, as usual, Nigerian lecturers were dragging um, girls for dressing. Anyhow, you search. You're going to find that. That you can always find. No matter the time, you will find a Nigerian man deciding what a Nigerian man should wear. Um, now, since we started, we have made accessible over 50,000 pages, right? Um, roughly two decades. It feels so. It, it feels like a lot because each page tends to be scanned at least twice, just for quality purposes. When we think about our future. We think of this as our future of five million pages. Imagine that each stack has fifty thousand pages. And, and the question is like, like, what's the point? Like, why are we not, like scanning newspapers? Like, there's so much we could do with the time. But the most important thing for me is right now in my life right now is this comic strip. So I was scrolling on Twitter um, yesterday. And I saw this comic strip. And it was a, a woman who was getting home and was ambushed by armed robbers. And so she, of course, was begging this. And when the armed robbers gave her a bag, she pulled out a gun and opened fire on, and, and killed all of them. And I was like, oh, this is so sick, all right? Um, and I kept scrolling. I was like, it's so sick, but it feels so familiar. And then at the bottom of the thread, I saw this. It was an actual headline. From PM News, housewife kills four robbers. This is why, this is pretty much why we do what we do. Um, it's fundamental to create unlimited utility. When people talk about history, we focus on the very big things, like, oh, what did Yaku do? How did he fight? Do? And those things are very important. But it's also the small things, right? It is, it is how we even like collect those things and how we think and remember them. Um, if, you, if, you, if, if, if Nicole like, wrote this in a movie, everybody's going to say, ah, ah, really, they hide. Um, but like, it did happen, right? And this is an example of how I think about the value of the work we're creating. It is going to um, UI um, at the Institute of African Studies and running into someone who is writing a paper about Nollywood, right? And she's using archiving as a reference. It's running into an engineer who is trying to build like a trivia game, and he's using like archiving um, as the basis, as the training data to use to make those things. It's running into someone making a textbook and seeing that, oh yes, a lot of how they are verifying how the information was collected in those times, right? It is, it is running into an economist who is trying to build like just open data sets look at inflation. For example, parents always make the case of, oh, yeah, like, a better time, right? So it's like, were those times really better? What, what did the numbers actually say? Because all these numbers, the one thing journalists know how to do is show up every day and collect the most mundane or magnificent stories of the time. And you probably heard the quote where today's journalism is tomorrow's history. Um, there's another interesting one. I tell the cover of a newspaper, and there was a small headline there. The, the headline was about the killing of a colonel, and um, the colonel was killed in the 90s at a police checkpoint. Now, the Nigerian army, as usual, uh, went on a rampage, attacking all policemen inside. So he forced policemen into hiding, um, and that led to a rise in the crime wave in Lagos. So to curb the crime wave in Lagos, 
there was a special unit that was redeployed um, that we now know as SARS. That's why they were Muftis. And what happened was Nigeria was to transition to democracy, but we kept SARS. But they retained a lot of their military excesses. And so the violence continued, the extrajudicial killings, and it led to the biggest event of our generation, which is NSAS, one of the biggest events of our generation. And the, the interesting thing is, I was like, oh, wow, this is an interesting connection. And then someone just put, replies the tweet and says, oh, his name is Rim Dan. There was a typo in the name. I said, oh, that's my grandfather. Um, and, and so when you set out to scan newspapers, you don't think one day someone's going to discover their grandparents and how the death of their grandfather um, led to thousands of people coming out across the country to protest. Um, but that is what access does. It helps us to like connect dots, to make connections in places that did not feel or do not even seem possible. An interesting story, um, I like to talk to old people. They have gist for days. Um, except because also I was not there. And I, I ran into this woman who was telling me about how in Kano in the 50s, they had canned jollof rice. And it, 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 I, I, like you cannot, I cannot just say, like, calm down, right? <laughs> um, but here's the interesting thing. I was like, I, I believe you, right? Now, a few months ago, a, like this, after we went live with archiving, this um, sibling, white, um, they, they were like, oh, they reached out and wanted to have a call. And so I had a call with them. And two of them lived in Lagos in May of 1966. Perfect timing, if you have the context. Uh, yeah, the program started shortly after. Um, and they were kids, they were teenagers. And they were telling me about how a soldier, like, he invited them to his house as they were kids, like, took them to, their, to his house. And the wife offered them hand salads. And I just remembered that in 2019, I had a conversation with a woman who said canned jollof. And I can assure you, canned salad is more horrible uh, than canned jollof. But it just, force, it, just, it just force you to ask, like, what are the things we have attempted to make? What are the things that we've tried? Um, when did jollof rice become mainstream? Like, these things appear to be very, very simplistic questions, but they help us to think more critically about our future and even our present. And, and so the way we think about our work is that we want to advance knowledge and understanding. Uh, because the very basis of building a future is having a strong foundational knowledge base. Now, I fave, no, actually, he said something. He said, if you don't like someone's story, write your own. Um, but the interesting thing is that. Like, we've been writing our story since 1859. I mean, before then, but at least we have written evidence of our story since 1859, when Iwe the, the oldest newspaper from Nigeria was ever published. But the problem remains, like, you just have to access, right? Um, and our job is fundamentally to find everything, make them accessible, and just, like, make more sense out of them. Uh, one thing I'd like everyone to think about and how this even affects you is back to something I said earlier. We are only as aware as how much we know about ourselves. And the question again is, if we know so little about ourselves, how we got here, like who the, like who the hell are we? Um, so thank you very much. <laughs>